Um, I just want to mention off, uh, start off, Hydro, or, uh, Alberta WaterSmart drove this project, but uh, it was really in collaboration with Hydrologics, the modeling support um, that we use, as well as Grand Duke Geomatics out of Lethbridge, who helped build the visualization tool, which I'll touch on in a bit. But this was a Bow Basin Flood Mitigation and Watershed Assessment Project to assess, assess flood mitigation options in the Bow Basin. So the objectives of this project were to work collaboratively with Bow River Basin water management experts to assess potential flood mitigation options, which included operational changes to existing infrastructure, natural and infrastructure, new infrastructure options. Um, this one, we wanted to use existing knowledge, data, and tools where possible. Um, and then we wanted to capture both the qualitative and quantitative assessment of each mitigation option. Um, whether we could actually model it or not, it, was, it wasn't just about the modeling and the results, but also the conversation with the people in the room. We wanted to identify unintended and intended uh, consequences of each potential flood mitigation option um, across the basin from a basin perspective. So if you do something in the headwaters, how might that impact somebody downstream? And we also wanted to, at the end of this, we need to be able to put forth recommendation on flood mitigation options to the Flood Recovery Task Force. So this project was aligned, was an aligned effort with the task force. Um, it was co-funded by the task force as well as Alberta, Alberta Innovates Energy and Environment Solutions. Uh, we did it in partnership with the Bow River Basin Council, or the BRBC, as well as the Bow Working Group, which is made up of the basin water managers as well as resident water, manage, uh, water management experts. The project process really focused in on collecting information um, from all the stakeholders, including the resident water management experts and the greater BRBC um, membership. So we included in the uh, modeling, uh, was a, over the five month period, there was three full working days um, from modeling sessions, as well as a, uh, two BRBC forums where we were able to do presentations and get feedback from the general um, membership of the BRBC. So it was a fairly short timeline that we had to do this project, um, but it worked out well. Uh, this is the Bow River Operations model. It was built and uh, it has been built and used by stakeholders in the Bow River Basin for the last four years. So it was a tool that was already available and uh, possible to use. It has the whole bow system, the Transalta system right there, um, the Highwood Sheep, and then the different irrigation districts as well as the city of Calgary. So it's a mass balance demand model. Um, it was at a daily time step for the whole historical record, so 1928 to 2009. And it allows um, stakeholders and, and groups of people to collaboratively manage or uh, assess mitigation options and, and alternatives using existing infrastructure, new infrastructure. And um, the bow or the Brom model is not a hydrodynamic model. It's not a mass balance runoff model or a rainfall runoff model. It's just a mass balance model, but implicit in the input data are stream flow, um, melt times, those sorts of things from the historical record. So in order to look at, really look at flood mitigation options, you can't do it at a daily time step, so we broke it down into hourly for two different flood events that we could get data for. So we got the preliminary flood data for 2013, and then we got flood data, hourly data for 20, 2005. Uh, so those are two fairly big floods on the Bow system recently that we could get the data for. So the black line is the simulated and the red line is the observed. So we were able to fairly um, well match the peak flows and then actually we had uh, higher flows in before and after the floods which essentially makes any modeling that we did a little more conservative than actual. But again it was to be able to assess different flood events not just 2013. So we wanted to be able to assess mitigation options at an hourly time step. In order to help um, kind of be able to visualize and quantify the changes to with mit different mitigation options, we wanted to be able to pr um, produce some performance measures rather than just graphs like hydrographs and looking at changes in flows. Sometimes flow numbers aren't that meaningful when you start looking at flood and flood inundation. So what we did was we, in uh, collaboration with Grand Duke Geomatics, we built a flood inundation visualization tool. Um, unfortunately, we were only able to do this for the city of Calgary, so for the bow and elbow basins in the city limits, we were able to do this for because it's fairly really data intensive. Um, what the city of Calgary was able to provide was a high resolution digital elevation model, as well as HECRAS transects and rating curves from their uh, HECRAS modeling that they had done. And in being able to do that, they provided us with the data and allowed us to be able to, with Google Earth interface, produce this visualization tool where you could zoom in and out and look at different flood extents from different mitigation option scenarios. 
So as you can see, the light blue is 2005 floods and the inundation that those caused on both the elbow and the bow through Calgary, and then 2013 floods are in the darker blue. So that was to kind of give stakeholders an opportunity to say, okay, if we did X, Y, and Z, what would the impacts be and visually be able to see it and, and start to talk about the benefits of those. So throughout the process, there are basically seven flood mitigation approaches that we kind of categorized everything into. I'm not going to go through them all, but they kind of boil down to relocation, um, dry dams, diversions, which we talked about yesterday, um, changing existing operations to existing infrastructure, storage on wetlands, uh, natural river functions, and then land management. For each of the sub-basins, so for the bow, the highwood and the sheep, and then the elbow systems, um, these concepts were broken down into short-term wins, like what could we do by 2014, by this spring, what, what could feasibly be done, medium-term and long-term mitigation strategies. Um, we also wanted to look at natural and new infrastructure as well as operational changes. So then we broke them down into these graphs or in these tables for each of the sub-basins. I'm not going to go through them all. Um, they're there. These slides are publicly available afterwards. But any of the underlying ones were actually modeled in Braum with the stakeholders. And then other ones we tried to just capture the conversation um, from the stakeholders and the water managers around those were possible. So there are some for the bow, the elbow, and the highwood and the sheep river systems. So an example of one of the short-term um, mitigation strategies, something that could actually be done for 2014, was to operate Ghost Dam and Barrier Dam, which are upstream of the city of Calgary on the Bow River and the Kananaskis tributary, um, for flood control. So these are Transalta structures. Transalta Utilities does not operate for flood control. They operate for hydropower. In 2013, they did what they could with their facilities, and they did a fairly good job at mitigating the peak flows through Calgary. Um, but this, is, this would be taking their structures and actually operating them for flood control, but using perfect forecasting. So we had the 2013 flood flows. We knew when the flood was going to hit. And so we said, if you knew it was coming, you didn't know how big it was going to be, but if you knew it was coming and you drew it down three meters on barrier and drew down the upper rule by five meters on ghost, as well as matching the flood operations that they did on Lake Minnewanka, Spray Reservoir and the Upper and Lower Kananaskis Reservoirs, what could be done to mitigate flows on the bow through Calgary. So looking at the hydrograph, um, the black line is what happened in 2013. The red line is what happened if you do that mitigation structure using Ghost and Barrier for flood control, again, mid, or, uh, matching the operations in the other reservoirs. And you could get it down to a, to a um, flood control target of almost just over 1,100 CMS, so cubic meters per second which is uh, about 600 CMS less than it was through the city of Calgary. So again, using existing infrastructure, the potential is there to mitigate floods rather than having to build something different or do nothing at all. So that's something that could be done by this spring of this year. But an agreement would have to be in place with Transelta to be able to do that. So here is the visualization tool. So the green is the 2013 flood, what actually happened. And then the 2014, um, what, what could we do with um, operating ghost and barrier differently? The blue, so the difference between the green, green and the blue is the difference those dams would have make, made in terms of flooding through Calgary. And again, there's, it's mostly on the bow, but a little bit on the elbow flooding because when the two, uh, when the confluence of the bow and the old mat, or the, at the confluence of the elbow and the bow, uh, you start to have backup water, and so that would have reduced the amount of backup water into downtown. So throughout the project, um, the conversation constantly turned around to, so what are we mitigating to and why? And this was a big question to the stakeholders. We initially pulled targets out of the Markin Panel Report, which I think we talked about yesterday. Um, but there was different flow targets for different communities and different reasons why they wanted those flow targets. So at the end of the day, you can engineer anything. Well, almost anything. And you can engineer things to mitigate and to almost stop almost every flood if you really wanted to. But the question is, do we want to do that? And what are the impacts of doing that? So it, all, it starts to boil down to more social policy questions. And what do we really want a society? And what are going to be the impacts of those decisions? So in order to put the context of what the mitigation structures would do or could do and what the options are out there and what we would have to mitigate to and why, we kind of broke it down into, um, for illustration purposes, to three different flow scenarios, so flow targets one, two, and three. And this was set, um, kind of flow target one was kind of the least mitigation options, 
and flow target two is a very aggressive mitigation for the whole basin. So I'll kind of go through those as mitigating options. Due to time constraints, I can't go through all three, but it'll kind of give you an idea of the trade-offs that would have to be involved and the conversation around what are we mitigating to and why. So the first one, flow target scenario one, this would be mitigating flow targets of 1050 CMS um, on the Bow River upstream of the elbow. Um, 450 downstream of um, Glenmore Dam on the elbow, um, 1500 through High River at on the Highwood River, and 750 through Okotoks on the Sheep River. So in order to do all of that, that would warrant the following mitigation. You'd have to implement an agreement to operate Transalta um, facilities for flood control. You'd have to operate Glenmore for flood control as it was done this year, but even a bit more aggressively. Um, Increase the diversion from Ghost River to Minnewanka. So during the flood flows, it flows through Ghost River. If you can divert more to Minnewanka and put it up higher in the system. Um, a diversion north around High River or to the south into the Little Bow. Um, a diversion from the Elbow River into Pritis Creek or one of the alternative routes. And then two dry dams on the Sheep River. Um, S2, which is upstream of Turner Valley and Black Diamond. And then Three Point Creek at the confluence with the Sheep River. Also included in that were land management practices, so we assumed land management um, best practices and that that would reduce um, inflow into the system by 1%. So it was a very conservative estimate based on literature because there's lots of debates on land management and how that would actually impact or not impact flood flows. And then wetland storage, we did another conservative estimate in terms of if we restored X number of hectares of wetlands, what would the storage capacity be in CDM or in cubic decameters? <coughs> and how would that you know, be able to uh, retain some of the flood flows. So all of those were included in this scenario. And if you did all of those on the Bow uh, River at Calgary, you'd be able to mitigate down to just below 1100 CMS. So at 1100 CMS in Calgary, you're still gonna have flooding issues, um, but you're not gonna have as severe as it was in 2013. And this is upstream of the elbow. <coughs> So if on the Elbow River, and this is downstream of the Glenmore Dam, um, if you did all those mitigation options, so the diversion, um, yeah, so the diversion out of the Glenmore and then Glenmore operations at the city of Calgary, you can get the flows all the way down to about 375, almost 400 CMS, which is much less than the 700 that went through this year. In terms of what that would look like in the visualization, so flow target one, the blue, and 2013, what happened in green, much different. Again, there's trade-offs to that. Through High River, um, if you had the diversion, whether it was to the north or to the south through the Little Bow, um, diverting that water could get you down from that roughly 1,800 CMS all the way down to 1,500 CMS target. And again, tar uh, this was based on numbers that the town of High River gave us in terms of what they're planning on doing with local berms. Um, so this would be able to, they'd be able to support these flows. And then through the Sheep River at Okotoks with two dry dams on that system, you'd be able to mitigate all the way down to 550 CMS, which would minimize any damage or most of the damage through Okotoks. So in terms of trade-offs, if you have these kind of flow targets, um, the trade-offs are, the good thing is it's fairly cost-effective. It's the least costly mitigation strategy of the three that we looked at. Um, with the least amount of environmental impact. And when I say least amount of environmental impact, essentially that boils down to the least number of dry dams. Um, there's huge overland flow diversions from the elbow into other systems, whether it's Pritis Creek or somewhere else. This brings up the question, which was talked about a lot, are we just transferring the risk to somebody else? And if you are transferring the risk, what's the liabilities around that? And is that fair? Um, there's still flooding at local areas, so even though you mitigate down to these levels, there would still be flooding on the bow, still be flooding on the elbow, there might be flooding on the highwood, and there would still be some flooding on the Sheep River. So local protection and response are still warranted. And less upstream detention, so if you're detaining less of this water and it's not flooding out all over the place and you're allowing it to go through and you're diverting it, and even in some cases speeding up the, um, or bypassing certain areas, you need to make sure that you consider impacts to downstream infrastructure, including Cars Land Diversion for the Bow River Irrigation District, as well as Traverse Dam for the Bow River Irrigation District, um, Bassano Dam for the Eastern Irrigation District, Twin Valley, and uh, Medicine Hat all the way down at the end of the system. So these are some of the trade-offs that have to be considered if we were to mitigate 
to these levels. And again, there would still be flooding. So flow target for scenario three, again, this was a very aggressive mitigation strategy. Flow on the Bow River, if we want to try to mitigate down to 540 CMS, essentially this mitigates all the flooding through Calgary on the boat, or most of it. Uh, there might be a few basements that get wet, but very minor. Um, Elbow River downstream of Glenmore, 180, that's their flow target to basically keep everybody dry. That's a very aggressive target. 700 went through there this year below the dam. High River, or last year I guess, High River, um, Highwood River at High River, 1100 CMS, and then the Sheep River at Okotoks, 550 CMS. So in order to do this, and I didn't go through scenario two, but scenario two um, had an additional um, dry dam or an additional diversion on the elbow. It also increased the highwood diversion up to 500 CMS from the 345. And it also added two dry dams, one on Ghost River and one on the Wipers Creek, and included everything else that scenario one had. So that's all of scenario two. And on top of that, for scenario three, we would be adding a dry dam on the bow main stem above Bear Spa. Um, you would have a tunnel for the Elbow River underneath 58th Avenue or an overland diversion from Glenmore Reservoir to the Bow or another dry dam on the Elbow River. And you would have an expanded highwood diversion instead of 500 CMS, you'd now be sending 700 CMS either north or south or a combination of both. So again, very aggressive mitigation strategy. What would that mean? Well, the bow at Calgary, um, even with all that infrastructure and those changes in operations, you couldn't even reach the 540 flow target. You get almost to about 700 CMS, which is still pretty good, but you won't reach that, four fifth, that 540 target. On the Elbow River downstream of Glenmore, again, massive diversions, lots of uh, infrastructure, including dry dams, you can get down to 180 as a target. So you can minimize flooding downstream of the dam and then most uh, upstream of the reservoir as well, but not all of it. What would it look like? Well, it would look fairly, when you go through Calgary, the rivers would look fairly normal if you did flow target three. Again, compared to the flow, um, 2013 floods in green, the blue is, looks like rivers. They don't look like they're flooding very much. Through the Highwood, uh, through High River, the Highwood, you would mitigate just above 1,100 CMS. And again, with local berming, they said that they're targeting flows of 1,800 that they could pass through. So 1,100 would certainly put less strain on the infrastructure that was put in place. So again, all the infrastructure on the Highwood, including the diversion, um, could mitigate <coughs> 1,100 CMS. Through Okotoks, the, the two dry dams, again, mitigate it to just above 550 CMS. Um, so a flow target there, minimizing most of the damage to the doors. So what are the trade-offs with scenario three? Well, it's very expensive. So if you include all of the mitigation options, you're looking at several billion dollars probably by the time all is said and done and built. Um, you have significant environmental, ecological, and recreational impacts because of the dry dams and headwaters of the sheep, the elbow, and the bow basins. You're placing significant investment in structures that may or may not be useful during the next flood. All of these structures pretty much were proposed based on 2013 flows. And when you look at structures such as a dry dam on Wipers Creek or Ghost River, um, what if the next flood hit Kananaskis and you didn't have a structure there? You have two very expensive dry dams sitting on fairly small tributaries that aren't being used. So what are we mitigating to and why? Are we trying to stop the 2013 or mitigate the 2013 flood or are we trying to mitigate all floods? Um, and then there's a large investment in a tunnel, the tunnel underneath Calgary, the 58th Avenue one, that can only help a limited area. And it also starts to increase velocities and uh, creates impacts downstream and concerns downstream. So if you're diverting water and you're sending it around communities that held the water in 2013, and you're speeding up those flows and sending it downstream with higher flood flows, are you going to impact downstream infrastructure such as the Sun and Dam? So in terms of flood mitigation, uh, emerging themes throughout the work, there were several emerging themes. This work's still kind of ongoing and we're still trying to finalize it. But there was a couple key themes that I just wanted to pull out of these. Um, maximizing natural resiliency is a crucial aspect of water management, but it's not going to stop a flood. Um, events like this, it doesn't matter how you change your forestry practices, how many wetlands you reclaim, big flood events are not stopped by natural infrastructure. But natural infrastructure is very crucial to watershed management, to restoration of natural flows, 
to uh, help mitigating low flows, which can happen in the same year as a flood. And they also help reduce the strain on any infrastructure that's put in man or uh, built in the basin. Um, getting out of the way is the only certain way to avoid flood damage. That came in loud and clear from the working group. If you want to mitigate flood damage and you want to not have any problems, get people out of the way. Again, that boils down to social policy and that's not an easy decision to make. Um, we wanted to make sure that things are done realistically and what can be done is communicated properly. So what could actually be done by 2014? You're not going to be able to build a dam. You're not going to be able to build a massive diversion before 2014 and probably even before 2015. Everything has to go through the right um, impact assessments, engineering assessments, and full cost benefit comparison for any large infrastructure needs to be done before they proceed. Um, flood mitigation must address many different types of flood events. We can't just mitigate for the 2013 flood because every flood happens differently. Water can come down different tributaries, and if it does, it changes the dynamics of when the water comes, where it comes, and why we're mitigating. Um, we need to make sure we're co coordinating with local efforts. So if, this, if the town of High River is burning and everything and, and able to plan for 1,800 or, or, yeah, 1800 or 1,500 coming through the, the town, why would we mitigate down to 1,000? So it, you need to make sure that you're coordinating with local activities as well as looking at it from a basin perspective. Um, throughout the process, there was very little support for dry dams, um, even on the elbow. People recognize that something should be done. Um, mitigation is important, um, but at the same time, the diversion seemed to be preferable to dry dams. Dry dams have a lot of implications, and I think a lot of unknown and unintended consequences that could happen, especially when you start looking at fisheries and the environment um, aspects of those. And then the final point was effectively linking forecasting to a system-wide operations is completely vital. Uh, when you look at operating existing infrastructure for Transelta, if you can't forecast them, why would you drain it down? And the other thing you have to consider is that we're not just talking about flood mitigation, but you have to consider drought, um, which is a big concern in the Bow Basin. Um, and, and all over the SSRB, you have to be able to just look at it from a watershed management perspective. So if you're going to draw down reservoirs, you also have to be able to forecast the ability to refill that year too. So it's not just forecasting the flood event and how to, how to deal with that, but also what happens after the flood event. So a few key take home points from this work. We cannot prevent floods or droughts, but we can achieve some level of mitigation, flood mitigation and also mitigation for droughts. So overall basin water management. Any mitigation option that is chosen is going to have consequences. Some are going to be positive, some are going to be negative, but they will have consequences. But the goal is to pursue those with the most benefit and the least negative impact. Mitigation solutions must collectively build resilience throughout the basin against the full range of potential future flood events. So again, what are we mitigating to, what do we want, and why? And then some of the most promising near-term opportunities that could be implemented for flood mitigation throughout the Bow Basin are operate Transalta facilities and the Glenmore Reservoir for flood control when needed, um, construct a diversion likely north around High River, and apply existing wetland and land management policies and plans to stop further degradation of these systems and to be able to enhance the natural systems and their ability to help mitigate floods and manage water in the basin as well as a key one is to reinforce downstream infrastructure to handle higher flow, whether it's Traverse Dam or Twin Valley Dam. If you're sending water or changing flows, which naturally would have come down, and you're putting more pressure on downstream infrastructure, loss of that infrastructure could be even greater than impacts from a flood. That's it.